Welcome to a very special edition of the World Metal Congress webcast. I'm Alexander Milas, and if you're not familiar with the kind of work that we do, um, well, we celebrate the global impact of heavy metal, and we also explore the issues that are faced by its community. And I don't think there's a greater issue faced by the heavy metal community, or indeed humanity, than the climate crisis as it stands. So we're gonna dive into a very special conversation at the invitation of Inferno Festival, one of my favorite festivals. And uh, it's just so great that they also host a conference as well, where we can also explore not just sounds, but these ideas. So before we get to the conversation, I thought it might just be useful to go around the room, perhaps starting with Lena, the co-founder of World Metal Congress. And, and maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what is this all about, this WMC thing we're doing? Hi everyone, it's really great to be hosted by Inferno to have such an important conversation. I'm Lina Khatib and I'm a co-founder of the World Metal Congress. And throughout this uh, pandemic, actually, we've been having a series of webcasts with metal artists, industry figures uh, from all over the world. Um, in the World Metal Congress, we gather people to talk about issues that matter. We celebrate global uh, metal wherever it exists on the planet which highlights the importance of preserving the planet, I guess, which is one of the reasons why we are here having this conversation today. Very good. And um, Nika, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, where, where are you hailing from today? And, um, and uh, what is it that uh, keeps you busy? Um, yes, uh, my name is Nika. I come from Slovenia originally. Um, I'm working at the Metal Days Festival. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. It's a pretty, yeah, not so big festival, 12,000 people um, in Slovenia. Um, what keeps me busy these days? Uh, well, a lot of things, <laughs> obviously not very connected to, to metal because uh, in Slovenia, we're still somewhere just out of the, I don't know which many lockdown, I'm not counting anymore. Um, but um, yeah, um, I am busy. <laughs> Let's not be mistaken. Of that we have absolutely no doubt. And um, and finally to Faye, um, uh, tell us a little bit about um, Music Declares Emergency and that t-shirt that you're wearing. <laughs> Perfect. Well, um, Music Declares Emergency is a group that I'm a co-founder of and we're a campaigning organisation um, bringing music into the fight against climate change. So that largely that is, is two things. One, it's helping to green the music industry um, because from a, a backing of a green industry, then artists can speak up and speak out. But it's also facilitating artists to get involved, use their voice, use their platforms. And, and do it en masse, really, so people don't feel like they're going out on a limb and feel like, you know, they're, they're putting themselves out there to, to be shot down. We're, we're trying to do it all together as an industry, as a, a huge thing. So we've got a campaign called No Music on a Dead Planet. I'm wearing a very special T-shirt here, No Music on a Dead Planet. Um, we have a bunch of different designs. Um, this one was created by Luke Priest. And for those of you who have already spotted the fact that creating new product um, is not the best for the environment, it's an incredibly green process. We're working on a, a sort of circular economy. So the t-shirts are made and you can send them back to the manufacturer at the end of their life cycle to be recycled into new t-shirts. So that's something that we're trying to encourage the music industry to get into. They're each printed to order. So there's no waste stock. Anyone who is in a band or has bands that they manage or record labels, et cetera, and festivals, anyone who's produced t-shirts will know having boxes and boxes of leftover t-shirts is a pain in the butt. And it's also awful because they go to landfill. So um, that's sort of the story of the t-shirt. The main thing around these t-shirts is, you know, we all wear our band t-shirts walking down the street so that other people can spot us and say, oh, I like that band too. You know, we, it's like wearing your, um, something that's important to you on your shirt so that you can have conversations, you can make friends, you go to the gig, you're wearing a t-shirt, you're in the pub maybe beforehand, you can see someone else in a t-shirt, you know that you're kind of already got something in common. So one of the reasons for us creating these no music on the dead planet t-shirts is, so you can do that with talking about climate change. Um, everyone's worried about climate change now, it's not just a niche, you know, it's not just the wackos, it's everybody. And it's just sort of letting people know that you're up for talking about it and finding solutions basically. So yeah, 
that's the t-shirt. <laughs> Very good. Well, um, so it, it, it comes across, you know, primarily as an awareness campaign. And I want to put this um, question to the group, you know, because of course, um, you know, we, we have been hearing about the climate change for a long time. I mean, some publications, for instance, The Guardian um, here in the UK um, made an editorial decision to stop calling it climate change and start calling it the climate crisis because um, it feels like as difficult as it is to heap bad news on top of our current pandemic, the things are interlinked, you know, although I think the thing that comes across about the climate crisis is that there is no vaccine. Um, there is no reversing irreversible damage. And when you're talking about geologic timeframes, um, uh, the human species lifespan is very, very slow. And uh, I guess it's not to be doom and gloom, but to think about perhaps positive ways that we can affect some change. So I suppose the conversation is really important. And so I guess, Nika, I mean, from, from your perspective as a festival organizer working behind the scenes and so on, people use the word sustainability rather a lot, but I'm not always sure um, if I understand what that means, but also from a practical standpoint, um, how easy is it to reduce a carbon footprint? I mean, as a festival organizer, do you feel like the tools are available to you to, to, to kind of maybe enact some of those principles? Well, for us, um, the story started way back in 2008. So uh, things that you have mentioned are nothing new to us. Um, back then, um, yes, I think we were like, like Faye said, we were like um, aliens at that time. Like, why would you do something like this? Why is this important? Are you crazy? Are you sure you want to do something like this? Nobody's going to come to your festival and so on. But um, I think that throughout the years, um, all this uh, sustainability and ecology and all these notions are somehow into, uh, got into people's heads and it's becoming easier and easier. My, my biggest um, yeah, advice to everybody is to lead by example. I mean, if you have the resources, if you can, of course, financially afford it, because let's be honest, some of the, some of the things that that maybe you want to do will be will be expensive at least for the first year or second year or third year but eventually um this if possible of course if one can afford it or a festival can afford it or an event it should not be a showstopper because um it's it's a it's a run on the long way nothing will happen throughout the night um first it's educating people um getting to know the 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 i mean you plan everything and then on site suddenly things change and so on. And there will be hiccups that you cannot anticipate even with planning. But at the end, um, I think it is very worth it. Um, but my biggest concern now that you have mentioned all this uh, crisis and momentarily how the situation is. And I also speak about this a lot. My biggest concern now is that due to this pandemic thing and everybody is taking care of their health everybody stopped or majority of it stopped uh, worrying about the, the, the planet. And this is my biggest concern now. So everybody wants to wear masks, everybody wants to get vaccine, but everything else is some kind of a side story at the moment. So um, I'm really looking forward to restart all this fa festival business because I'm really curious how much of this that we already built on the long run is or it stays in people's heads and minds and everything. So this is my biggest concern or thought at the moment. Look, uh, I have to be completely transparent. Um, I live in East London. Um, uh, you know, to me, um, access to the resources and means to be green um, in a performative way are, are all around me. You know, um, you know, I can go down to my organic shop, I can buy vegan food, I can just think about all those sorts of things. But, but from a practical and, in, you know, a music industry perspective, how difficult is it to make those choices? I mean, I, I fully believe that if you create the market, then the market will grow, right? You know, um, if there is a market for greener alternatives, then more people will be able to choose them. You can't expect everybody to be revolutionary. You just have to make it easy for them to, to make the change. I mean, is, is, that, is that kind of the message that Music Declares Emergency is driving, Faye? Is that what we're trying to put across, that, that you can actually affect change in that way? Um. Interesting question. We, I mean, I think that's really interesting that you said it's a performative way of being green, you know, visiting a local shop, you know, the, the expensive organic shop on the corner, if you can afford to do that. And um, that is one way of doing stuff. Um, but what we're actually pushing at Music Declares Emergency and our declaration really is based around is demanding governments take huge steps because we can, 
shop at the local organic shop all we want, but if governments aren't creating the infrastructure, the power infrastructure, transport infrastructures, the things that need to be done on a, on a huge scale, then there's no, you know, there's no point doing all these little green things we do. So one of our sort of remits is that we don't really discuss, we discuss in the music industry what you can do to green the industry, but we're not pointing the finger at individual people saying, you need to recycle more, you need to do this, you need to go vegan, you need to do that. It's, of course, those things are great for the environment and there's loads and loads of places telling people how they can individually change. But we're an industry, I mean, in the UK, the music industry is huge. It's something like nine billion pounds a year. It's our biggest sort of soft power influence in the world, really. It's, it gets everywhere, British music. And that is a huge amount of power. And as an industry, we can, and culture has always done this, is push sort of that systemic governmental cultural shift that needs to happen. So we're actually sort of going for the really big, the big guns, basically. <laughs> um, if, I, if I may here just compliment what you just mentioned, Faye, by uh, asking Nika, if you could just tell us some of the things that you have done uh, with Metal Days that worked when it comes to uh, supporting sustainability and, and the environment. So what are some of the measures that you are implementing? Well, one of the biggest things on our starting point was that we completely eliminated tent pegs at the festival uh, camping area. This was a huge problem for us for, because the festival takes place in a, in a really uh, yeah, village area. And these pastures, this green, green thing that becomes festival camping, are actually pastures for animals. And we had a lot of complaints and also threats that they will not allow us to do the festival there anymore because once we pick up our tents and everybody goes home, then those cows and sheep and everything go there and they completely damage their feet or whatever they're called. And it was, yeah, it's, it's really funny to think about it, but for us, it was really like, I mean, thinking in a different direction, nobody would think about something like this. It's really completely idiotic thing, to be honest. But I mean, for somebody that just comes there and wants to camp and enjoy the festival. But this was a really a learning point or learning curve for us. And the second big thing that happened for us was um, inventing so-called garbage deposit. Um, this is a thing that you every visitor has to pay when it comes to the festival area. They get some kind of a on their pay card, it's the deposit of 10 euros is, uh, let's say, reserved. Then you get two trash bags. One is for plastic and one is for mixed garbage. And then when you bring these filled and yeah, garbage bags to the garbage deposit area, bags are taken and you get your money back. And throughout these years, and this is always happened, was happening like in 2000 and let's say 10. I'm just going to mention two very small things. But what I want to point this out to is how the mentality of people changes with the right incentives. You know, if, if we would probably start with something like threatening people or, you know, try to educate them in a different way, I don't know if this would work. But this, for example, when we actually engaged the people um, with taking part in this action, it was completely different. Of course, yeah, at the beginning, it was like, I still remember the conference when I was explaining this. And people were like, nobody's going to come. <laughs> you know, people are just not going to come to the festival. Why would somebody just leave 10, 10 euros? Because they don't get it back. If they don't bring the, 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 the bags with trash, they don't get it back. It was like, nobody's going to come. But throughout the years, it's, it's really how the, the mentality of festival goers. And we don't just have recurring people. We have a lot of people that fluctuate from year to year. Um, how the mentality changes in a way that suddenly, like five years later, you don't just get separated two trash bags, but you actually get people who want to have more bags, who want to separate, who want to camp in clean camping area and so on. So this is probably the biggest um, yeah, evolution that can happen in the festival area or at the festival if you actually get your festival goers to be your voice, let's say it like this, to be your best example of a behavior or your incentives or sustainability or whatsoever. So this is um, my side. And, and what about the artists? I mean, Faye, you're also an artist and mm. um, I'm pretty sure you've had experiences over the years that probably contributed to why you're with Music Declares Emergency today. So can you tell us about 
the good things and the bad things that you've encountered? Yeah, well, I think one of the things that's a real luxury as an artist is that you get a lot of time on your hands when you're touring and it, it, that time frees you up to think about big world problems like climate change and it, it is really a luxury if you're working two jobs every day you just don't have the capacity to sort of take in that stuff on the whole so it is a real I guess privilege in a way that you get all of this time you get all of this travel and you take in so much stuff and then you realize as you're traveling every time you get on a flight, the number of flights you get on as a touring artist is insane. The, the tour, like the, the, what's the routing of the tours can be insane. One time we went all the way around the world in about three weeks and it just was bonkers. And it's not only, it's like the carbon footprint to an extent, but also the amount of time you spend in an airport looking for vegan food. <laughs> If anyone's looking for vegan food in an airport, it's a nightmare. Um, but you just spend so much time there. You're not like you're not around creativity. You're not around culture. You're just in an airport for so much of your time, and that's not as an artist. That's not going to help you grow and create good work. So there's loads of different reasons out, you know, alongside the ecological that that talk um, to think about the way we tour and stuff like that. I mean. I'm not for one second saying that artists shouldn't tour. It's one of the great things that we have is music from all around the world. That should continue for sure. But um, it's sort of realising the footprint of that whilst having so much time sat in an airport lounge to think about it is um, probably why, why these two things came together for me. But I was also, um, if I may, just going to say about what Nika was saying, I think it's such a great... Um, initiative to offer people money back for their trash. I mean, that's great. It probably saves you money on having it picked up as well. And it's just kind of works, mm -hmm. but also the mentality around it. I think we've all grown up, myself included, you throw yourself in the bin, it disappears. You flush the toilet, it disappears. It's like this, we're living like babies in a way. You think you can leave your tent pegs in the ground and like mummy's gonna pick them up for you. That's yeah, the mentality that we're all living in. Yeah, but for me, if I can add for, or for me or for us, it was interesting, you know, how people actually go to these events and then they just, because, okay, this is one thing. So yeah, you are like a little baby and just things disappear, you know, little dwarfs just clean everything up. <laughs> yeah. that's, one, that's, one, that's one thing. But you know, other thing is that, for example, if you would be, or most of us, if we would be walking around London, for example, nobody would just throw beer around or <laughs> trash around or leave food somewhere. No, but when you come to the festival, this is completely normal. You can just mm. go and pee everywhere. You can just throw your trash just about everywhere it comes. You know, nobody is even thinking about it. That's why then when we walk around the festivals, it's a lot of garbage everywhere. And if people would just think a little bit and say, whoa, I mean, who wants to camp here around all this trash so that's why i think it's 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 just this behavioral change there's absolutely no need that one would behave differently in the city of berlin than on our trash or our, on our campsite why or a festival area just be yourself you know but then again if we can just when while you are with us for this week if we can offer you a wide variety of plant-based food, if we can offer you a way to, to separate your trash, if we can offer you, I don't know, instead of all the plastic uh, plastic cups and everything, we have all these biodegradable things at the festival. If we can offer you all that, then well, that's then a win-win already. So can I ask, I mean, um, something um, that Faye said um, in relation to metal days is, is really interesting. It's that the whole idea of um, incentivizing people to do things but also trying to affect change at a policy and a governmental level, you know, um, not to just pressurize individuals to, to make change, but also to um, enact, I guess, much broader sweeping sorts of things. I mean, what would make it easier for a festival promoter to make these sorts of choices? Is it tax incentives? Is it the kind of policy changes that mean it's almost um, impossible to, uh, you know, have a certain size um, footprint. I mean, what, what would actually help facilitate? Because I, I appreciate that we have a very international audience here, but um, it seems that there's almost like a macro level um, that is being addressed by things like music declares emergency. And I, I just wonder what would actually 
make it easier to make these changes. Is this for me or for Frey? <laughs> well, um, why don't we start with you, Nika? I mean, what, what would make your um, life easier? Yeah, I don't know. Taxes for sure are one big thing. But, um, you know, as much as Slovenia is green, let's say, in, in, in a way, um, I, I still think that this connection between, um, or at least between these large music events and uh, this sustainability ecology notion is quite lacking, I would say. I, I, I'm not sure how is this going to change now with all these pandemic and things, but um, I still, I mean, I will never forget the, the fact, for example, I can give you just one example how things work in our country. Um, so I, I don't remember the year anymore, but I think it was like five years ago, we changed completely our uh, plastic um, at the festival. So we don't have any cups, cutlery or whatever it comes from plastic. Everything is biodegradable. And uh, we have a local company that's uh, collecting our trash, like local waste management company. And um, we figured out, um, we after we already, of course, did all the planning and we purchased already everything and everything was already delivered to the festival. We figured that the cost of biodegradable uh, um, you know, trash at the festival will be for picking up and of course management afterwards will be five five point two times higher than if we would use plastic. So if somebody can explain how this is good <laughs> and how this is beneficial for for the climate crisis and everything, um, I am ready to discuss this. But for us, this was, for example, something that we did not calculate on. And it was a huge blow, of course, for us financially, because, I mean, I knew that the biodegradable waste collection is higher by price, but I did not know it is like 5.2 times higher. And uh, imagine the tonnage of the biodegradable um, trash after the festival and so on. So this is, for example, something that, and of course we went with this further to the government and so on, but there was just no, um, nobody. I mean, everybody was like, just use plastic. You know, what, why are you, people were looking at us like you're completely crazy. Why would you spend just to, and there's also one thing I need to mention, all the plastic that we would otherwise use, we would get it for free. So the company that sells beer at the festival would get us free cups. We did not have to pay a single cent Therefore, we spent, I think it was around 300,000 euros, if I don't remember still correctly, on all the cups and everything for the festival and cutlery. And uh, I don't know, everything was from, from biodegradable material, it still is. But you know, this is just something that, for example, somebody, if somebody would probably yeah, need to step up a little bit on this. Of course, today it's different. This was, like I said, five or six years ago, which was still pretty, let's say visionary at that time or revolutionary and pretty really people really thought we were crazy. But today, as we know, for example, the European Union already has now banned this single use of plastic at, at events and so on. So this is a definitely a step towards the right direction. And I also see in Slovenia that um, I'm just speaking about plastic now because it's the only thing that I actually have um, thought of at the moment uh, has um, made some steps towards this. So now it's also governmental, um, or at least in Ljubljana, the capital, um, it's enforced to have these biodegradable uh, materials used on events and so on. Um, but when it comes to, for example, let's say transportation, um, the, the place where we are located in Tulmin, it's a very rural area of Slovenia. Of Slovenia. There are very bad even road connections, um, yet alone with train and so on. And we had some ideas that we want to, let's say, rent or have a special spe yeah, spe uh, metal days train um, just for us, for our visitors, that we could, instead of bringing them with cars, they could leave the car somewhere or maybe come with plane and we would get them with train to our festival and so on. And since the... Slovenian railways are, are uh, governmental, I mean, they're a um, regional company owned by the government. We saw that maybe this would be a good idea. It did not happen, <laughs> not yet. And so on, I think everything is just moving really slowly. And um, that's the, I can again say my worry from the beginning of this panel that this, what's happening now is just going to really slow everything down again. And we are going to end up with sustainability really, really a couple of 10 years behind. Um, I really hope I'm wrong. I'm 
So I'm honestly hoping I'm wrong, but I don't think this will be the case. Hmm. As, shall I add some, I was thinking about the power of how you power festivals as well. And um, waste is a huge side of things. And then the, the power of what energy you're using to power the stages, the sound, the lights, the whole festival, plus all of the audience travel, um, as Nika mentioned as well, that's probably the, the biggest emissions are from audience travel to the festival. Um, it's, that's something that really needs to be handled at a, a macro level, as you said. Um, governments could stop funding the fossil fuel industry, that would be useful. Um, they could also add more and more sort of funding for renewable energies and increase the infrastructure of renewable energy so that a festival site could potentially plug into the grid and run off renewable energy. That's something that can happen. Um, it needs sort of huge, um, you know, governmental level coordination to make it happen. So that's just a really simple thing and kind of thing we're trying to um, campaign for. Um, also increasing, um, as Nika was saying, the infrastructure of how people can get to a festival. We drive places because getting a train is in, in the UK is incredibly expensive. And the, if you've ever tried to get a train to a festival, it can be okay, but often it's very difficult. The trains are packed. They don't put on any extra trains for Glastonbury, for example, even though 200,000 people are going to a tiny village. Um, they just think, oh, it's okay. We'll just have the normal number of trains. That's all do. So it's, you know, extra trains, extra transport, and just, you know, just accepting that people are, are doing this. People are going to go there. Let's make it environmentally friendly. Let's make it nice. Let's make it enjoyable to get the train there. Let's make the prices lower. So that's, um, again, it's our, our trains are privatised in the UK, but can also, you know, governments have a lot of um, sort of swing over what happens with trains as well. So it's... Yeah, that's why there's so much to be done at a huge level as well, alongside all the amazing work that's sort of going on with festival organisers. And I mean, it's so commendable, Nika, that you spent all of that money. I mean, it must have been painful to say, I'm going to lose 300 I'm not going to go into numbers anymore. <laughs> <laughs> even this when I was thinking about, no, 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 I'm not going to go into numbers anymore. Yeah, no, it must have been a painful thing to just make that decision and say we're gonna we're gonna spend this money because we believe in this so so strongly and that's such a it's people like you and, and decisions like that that have really led the way in this space so that's um, yeah I just wanted to add something else just quickly um for us for example it would be much beneficial to or easier much easier um to be owning the festival ground throughout the year as well then we could build um, biodegradable toilets, then we could build our solar um, or whatever, uh, carbon, whatever, anything that can be left there at the festival area and could be there throughout the year would be much beneficial for us. But unfortunately, this is not the case. But luckily, we, in terms of electricity, we don't use any generators. We are plugged into the, let's say, green source of energy because the, the provider has some green sources as well, electric, electricity provider. So at least that, that's at least the, the one, yeah, possible. Well Faye, can, can I ask, with Music Declares Emergency, have you found it easier to rally the artists and the industry than rally governments to kind of be responsive to what you're demanding? Yes, definitely. I mean, I think something that we found when we launched two years ago is that the industry not only what well, they were super ready, people were ready for this. They were ready to be coordinated, join in with something and say, look, we need to green the industry. There's so many people in the UK music industry doing amazing work already as well. And again, with Impala in Europe and, and the AIM um, group in the UK, there's there's so much work in this space being done. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think with, with artists, so many people want to speak out, so many artists care. I think a lot of artists have a similar experience that I had and you start noticing your own climate footprint and have, have been just genuinely not wanting to be hypocritical, talk about climate whilst also getting on a plane. So one of the things we're trying to do is sort of get away from that 
who's to blame mindset we're all part of this system you know anyone who's been to a gig of an artist who isn't from their hometown and has paid a ticket is part of that system anyone you know it's not if an artist wasn't to travel then the audience goes to the artist so that's you know many 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 more times um less efficient than the artist actually traveling around so it's one of the things is about you know you don't have to be perfect you don't have to be a completely zero waste vegan perfect human being to speak on climate you know we're all there's no time for that there's no time for us to be perfect before we speak out um it's about getting that huge cultural power that music has to speak to audiences people don't trust politicians anymore people trust some people trust scientists some people don't but people trust the musicians that they love um they believe in their lyrics, they believe in what they say online, they believe in, in so many aspects. Um, and that's because it, it comes from a genuine place. Musicians, like everyone, are just people. And it's speaking out on a topic like this with that level of um, following and adoration, really, from your fans is uh, it's hugely powerful. So yeah, it's, it's a step-by-step -step process, I think. You've got to make the ground, you, I mean, governments react to what people are going to vote for, really. So that's, or well, they should, if you're in a country where elections aren't rigged. <laughs> but um, that's, yeah, so that's what we're sort of trying to create is that sense of um, just everyone realising that everyone else also wants the same thing. We all want action. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's interesting that you mentioned voting and, you know, democratic processes, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm going to just throw it out there. Um, I, uh, I suspect that very few people would vote for a blatantly pro-racist, pro-homophobic, pro-transphobic policy, right? But when it comes to not uh, railing against things that are clearly going to devastate our environment and so on, um, people, you know, it's a debatable issue, you know, um, there are other things that are absolutely set in stone. Um, but when it comes to the environment, it, it, it's there's a wishy-washy approach to policy, but also voting and so on. And I, I guess what we're really talking about is we're trying to create a world where the unthinkable is no longer possible. You simply will not permit in a democratic, free and fair society that the government is allowed to destroy the environment, that corporations are allowed to behave mm. in an unchecked fashion. You need to make it as unpalatable as any of these other violations of this isn't science policy, environmental policy is about human rights. It's about future generations. And, and I suppose I want to use that as a premise for an open-ended question. And I don't want to be too um, you know, critical um, of anything, but you know, where do we stand with, I think, something that we've all heard about? Um, for instance, like Extinction Rebellion, you know, which everybody has heard of, right? You know, um, an enormous environmental awareness campaign. But what's the difference between something like that and an organization, perhaps Faye can speak on this, an organization that's actually pressuring government to actually affect change, you know? Um, because, you know, displaying how you feel about things is very different from actually going out there and altering the trajectory of history and so on. Is there a danger in flag waving when what we really need right now is immediate action? I think it's it's interesting you make that that uh, sort of contradiction between Extinction Rebellion and a, an organisation that's lobbying government because XR's main sort of um, key things were, were taking the conversation away from it's your personal choice, you have to recycle, you have to do this and that, and reframing it saying governments need to act. Ultimately, that's... And um, the first rebellion certainly um, ended with... The government listening, um, parliament declaring a climate emergency and a, a meeting between Extinction Rebellion and um, Michael Gove, uh, who was the environment secretary at the time. Um, so I think those two things are one and the same thing. Um, and it, I think it's been a really important part of the climate movement, that messaging, the emergency messaging that came from Extinction Rebellion and also the reframing of it being this, it's your fault if you're not vegan, it's your fault if you're um, 
doing something incorrectly, you're not recycling properly and saying, no, actually, yes, of course, that stuff as well. But really, it's governments who are the only only sort of I mean, governments have known about these issues for 30, 40 years. It's not new. <laughs> it's just this. Actually, we need to do something now. It's it's uh, as we say in England, it's squeaky bum time. Um, <laughs> as they say. I don't know if that's a really weird comment to say, but um, it's, yeah, I think that's something that Extinction Rebellion have done really, really well, even though they're incredibly unpopular throughout certain populaces, they didn't set out to be popular. They set out to, to create some change. So I think they've done that really effectively. I mean, personally, I'm, I'm quite encouraged, to be honest, by this conversation, because I'm seeing very, uh, high complementarity between what Nika is doing and what your organization is doing, Faye, because it's very clear that you need both. You need the kinds of grassroots uh, awareness and in a way mobilization uh, by, by practice, if we can call it that, that, that Nika is uh, doing. And at the same time, the level of lobbying that Music Less Emergency is doing. And the lobbying is, as you're saying, part of it is directed at the industry. Uh, I mean, I was looking at some of your campaigns, such as a campaign to stop using jewel cases uh, for CDs because they're not recyclable. And as you said, the harder question, which is uh, addressing policy and addressing governments. And as you said, the combination of both as displayed by uh, re perhaps Extinction Rebellion, the large constituency that the music uh, scene can present can hopefully show governments that there is a way out and that there is enough uh, support out there at the popular level, you know, by, by people for, for these things to improve. So, yes, this will take time, but, you know, when do we stop? We, we can't just say it's too early. We have to do it now. And, and this is very, um, very encouraging. Um, but I also know, because again, we're the World Metal Congress and we deal with the globe. Um, there are so many places around the world where the environment, unfortunately, is, is not even on any high priority list for governments. You know, we're talking places in the developing world where they, you know, might say, you know what, we have bigger issues to deal with right now. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, it shouldn't be the case, but this is the case. But even there, I have to say there have been some initiatives where people have been trying to make their festivals sustainable, for example, or have been trying to rally uh, people uh, around environmental awareness. And I can give you examples of that happening in places like Lebanon and places like Nepal, uh, for instance. So um, I think uh, th there is potential, hopefully, um, through conversations like this, for the world to see that there are things that can be done, even if government is not really responsive. So thank you. I'm, I'm very encouraged today. Indeed. It's a, it's a great conversation to be having. And these are important issues because they really do affect us all. Um, you know, it's something that Faye said, you know, I don't want to date myself. Um, but, you know, look, I'm 44 years old. And I remember when recycling was a brand new thing. And it's like, literally, what is this symbol and why are we doing it? You know, and the response is, why are we doing this? Why are we playing with garbage and all that? A lot of this is really about just getting in front of people, isn't it? You know, it, it's not really difficult to argue. Do you a want to destroy the planet or b preserve the planet? Pretty much everybody is in favor of a, but what that actually means in terms of your choices, but also your consumer choices, is something that is really interesting to me. And I, I wonder, um, Nika, in terms of how you communicate to people who buy tickets that you are a environmentally conscious organization and so on. I mean. Obviously, um, that's so important. I mean, to be honest, if I have a choice between two festivals to go to, I'm generally, I'm going to try and choose the one that I think is probably, you know, got a great lineup, but a swinging vote is also going to go toward one that I feel cares about our world as well. So, so how do you communicate that to everyday people? I mean, is it, is it just something that's happening quietly behind the scenes or do you kind of um, let people know that this is what you're up to? We communicate carefully. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. Um, well, by now, I think that this, all these green initiatives that we do, it's also on the website and so on, are already pretty, let's say, out there. So everybody is pretty much aware of this. But, but at the beginning, um, well, one of the 
the ideas that we actually started working from is the fact that uh, most people operate in a way that yeah, the change is good and I know I'm doing something good, but somehow still think that the change is going to happen just by other people fixing it. Like, uh, I know, you know, trash is there, but um, somebody else is probably going to pick it up or, you know, this is just the whole premises of this and environmental idea, I would say out there. That everybody expects the things that will change, but nobody wants to actually be a part of it. Or let's just say somebody else is going to fix it for them. Um, that's also one of the reasons why government has to be included in this because I personally know people that actually, or let's say we are friends, just told me, uh, yeah, I know that this, uh, let's say, I know that not plant-based food, eating meat, for example, every day is bad for me and my kids and environment. But once the government will say it's bad, I tell you I'm going to be a part of it, but not until then. And this is actually people I know personally. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm always thinking, but if this is like people I'm surrounded with, how is like the rest of the world operating on this? So this is from my idea. But um, to be honest, in terms of communication, um, I think honesty um, is probably the best uh, way here. And as I mentioned already, also leading by example, um, I, um, I can tell you one little thing about the food at the festival. Um, obviously, I am, a, I'm still, I am living on plant-based only. <laughs> I'm still alive. No protein deficiency. I'm fine. Um, but um, we completely switched from um, promoting, let's say, vegan food stands, vegan this, vegan that, towards plant-based. Um, with this was one step, for example, no more vegan, but plant-based. But the second step is just food. You know, we're not going to promote or we didn't promote anymore. Hey, this is plant-based burger. Hey, this is plant-based, I don't know what. No, here's your burger. You know, tastes well, it's healthy. Um, it's, uh, I don't know, sustainably made, um, blah, blah, blah. Here's your burger. Or this is French fries. Yes, it's plant-based all the way. Did you know it? No, here's your French fries. You know what I mean? It's just this switch in mentality. Um, sometimes it is good to be loud about something, but sometimes you just need to, let's say, adjust your expectations or adjust your language to a way that normal people don't feel threatened, don't feel engaged too much, don't feel like you are um, entering their private area because let's say food is very important part of every, every person. And if you are just like digging too much in there, something that they feel comfortable at, probably it's going to end up in not so good ways. So if you are just choosing the, the words carefully and approach it, I think we can come a long way like this. Very well said. Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, in terms of our time, unfortunately, uh, we can't claim to have all the answers, but I think we've framed some incredibly important questions. But I think, as Nika said at the very start of our conversation, um, sometimes you just have to show a little bit of leadership by example. You know, just you just have to do it. And I think, Faye, as you said, you can't always be perfect. You just have to try. You know, um, you know, there is no complete solution to this problem. It is systemic. It affects every level of society. And I'm so pleased to be uh, hosted by Inferno Festival uh, with the World Metal Congress to, to talk about these issues because it, it is such an important one, arguably the most important one there is. I mean, a, a final thought, Lena? Well, just to say that we need to keep this conversation going and not just through festivals like Inferno and the World uh, Metal Congress uh, webcasts and uh, even face-to-face -face meetings when we are able to have them next, but uh, all of us by, by practice and everyone can do what they can. Um, but as I said, I'm very encouraged that uh, there is a lot of momentum already. Uh, that perhaps needs also more attention so that other, others can be encouraged and see that there are success stories that can be built on. Very well said. And finally, Nika, where do I go to find out more about Metal Days? www.metalbase.net <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And of course, when, once we are back, just come and visit us. I think it's uh, it's uh, it's the best uh, the best way to 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 meet us all and to figure out that you can actually enjoy the festival in a clean environment. Yeah, sounds fantastic to me. Um, that's a deal. And um, Faye, where can we go to learn more about Music Declares Emergency? 
Well, our website is www.musicdeclares.net and our socials, Twitter and Instagram are at Music Declares. We're also there, searchable on Facebook. Fantastic. Well, um, on behalf of everyone at WMC, thank you so much for joining us today and this stimulating conversation. Um, as Lena says, one that 100% needs to continue. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.